Tracks Highlights, coming up on the show. Bright idea. Artist Michael Batz gives a blue aura to the Hamburg Cruise Days event. Speechless. We're in Perigueux, France for Europe's largest mime festival. Green Thumb. Three culture vultures show us their gardens. Euromax Highlights. And here's your host, Karin Hamstedt. Hello there and welcome to our Highlights Edition, which kicks off this time with a major event on the German cultural calendar and one that every year gets a lot of highbrow attention and press. The Bayreuth Festival, traditionally highly conservative, celebrates the operas of one Richard Wagner, but this time for the first time ever, it loosened up just a bit for the sake of rekindling some interest in Wagner's challenging body of work. And that was a move that was appreciated by many. Celebrities and glamour on the red carpet. These images from Bayreuth are nothing out of the ordinary anymore. What is out of the ordinary is the way that Wagner fans will view their opera here. Public viewing spectators are reserving for themselves the best opera seats. For the first time in the history of the Bayreuth Festival, an opera is to be shown on a big silver screen in the open air. The Master Singers from Nuremberg, produced by Katharina Wagner, is already on the program. It was her idea to put this opera up on the screen. The opera had also a very... Opera sometimes has this image, outdated, crusty, old-fashioned, boring and endless. Public viewing could change this image. If all goes well, people might conclude the opposite. The big events organizers are as busy as bees just two days before it opens. The images of the opera have to find their way from the Festspielhaus onto a 90 square meter film screen outdoors. But even more difficult will be the acoustics. A surround system of 50 speakers is supposed to guarantee a perfect audio experience. We're trying to make opera accessible and understandable to people through the use of a different medium. We're using high-tech visual and acoustic technologies in film, a medium that people are familiar with. This new relationship to opera will hopefully draw people to live opera itself in the opera hall. Wagner for free. A welcome gift for anyone who is unable to get a ticket to the Bayreuth Festival. It's also proof of Bayreuth's arrival in the world of modern media. International fans of Wagner will be happy to hear that for 49 euros, you can even watch the performance live on the internet till the beginning of August. The internet will allow us to reach Wagner fans the world over, as well as those who are simply curious about his works. This is, of course, a big plus for the Bayreuth Festival. It'll help create new pools of customers and create more interest in the event. The public viewing concept is already being received positively. 15,000 people are watching the master singers of Nuremberg on the big screen. Indeed, a little bit of that Woodstock spirit is in the air at Bayreuth's festival grounds. Of course, nothing can replace the atmosphere and experience of seeing it inside the Festspielhaus. But this is super too. I don't regret coming here at all. A lot of people who wouldn't usually be interested are here. It's great. So much joy, so many happy faces among the audience. The performance was fantastic. Whether on the green hill among exclusive guests in a glamorous atmosphere, or lying under the sky on a quilt for that open-air feeling. Wagner's music is there for everyone. For Katharina Wagner, this represents an achievement, something she has hoped for. I think he would have been pleased. He was, after all, an artist who wanted everyone to see and appreciate his work. He might have done it the same way himself. The first Wagner public viewing in Bayreuth has been a resounding success, and it's likely this will not be the last one either.
Wine lovers will recognize the name Maya Nekel as one of Germany's most highly regarded vineyards. It's located in the country's smallest wine region in the R Valley, just south of Bonn. And in recent years, their Rieslings and especially their Pinot Noirs have raked in countless prizes. But perhaps most exciting is the fact that a brand new generation is now running the show. She always wanted to grow wine, but she wanted to become a doctor. But since June, sisters Dörte and Micah Nakel have been running the Meyer Nakel Vineyard, a family business spread out over 15 hectares. You're part of the entire production process, and in the end, you sell what you produce. It's an extremely intricate interplay that you don't have in any other field. And of course, wine is great. We've always enjoyed drinking it ourselves. And that's not the only thing. You're outdoors, then in the cellar, and you also deal with customers. There are so many aspects. The sisters' interest in wine has its roots in a family tradition going back five generations. Their father, Werner Nickel, made the vineyard famous just over a quarter of a century ago when he developed a new variety of Spätburgunder, a high-quality dry red wine. And that's when the Meyer Nickel wines began to take off. It's a really good feeling to know the thing you've spent a lifetime building up will be carried on, especially when it's your own children and daughters at that. Thirty years ago, that would have been unimaginable. The wine is aged in special oak barrels. It's a method the young winemakers plan to continue using in the future. But like their father, they have ideas of their own and aren't afraid to experiment. Even though winemaking is a time-consuming process, trends emerge quickly in the wine world. And one of them is rosé wine which has become increasingly popular in summer. The refreshing alternative, which is made from red grapes, is also a hit with the Nakel sisters. Rosé is very versatile. It can be anywhere from a pink color to more of a salmon, or almost orange. It can take on a wide range of different aromas, either with a lot of fruits or more flower-like. Rosé is definitely an exciting wine. For Dörte and Maike Nekel, wine is a passion and also a profession. They belong to a new generation of winemakers in Germany that's trying to stake out their own path while staying true to tradition. The ground here is slate, and the minerals and fruit that you taste in our wine are distinctive. It's not just any old wine that can be copied. It's something special, something out of the ordinary. And we definitely keep a close eye on quality, but we also don't neglect tradition and regional aspects. Whether rosé, white or red, the sisters are eagerly awaiting their first harvest as wine growers. And until then, they're hoping that the rest of the summer will be sunny for a superb 2008 vintage. And now it's up to the northern German city of Hamburg, where they celebrated their annual cruise days this past week. A five-day long festival devoted to the world's biggest and most luxurious cruise ships. The event saw some 13,000 vessels, including the Queen Mary II and the MS Deutschland grace the harbor, a perfect playground for one of Germany's top light artists. <laughs> Hamburg is a rhapsody in blue. Landmarks like the St. Michael's Church and the Kölbrand Bridge appear in a new light. Everything is illuminated. The ships in the harbor too. The star guest at the opening of the Hamburg Cruise Days Festival is the Queen Mary II. The topography and scenery of the Hamburg harbor are special. Michel Batz came up with the idea of transforming the harbor into a stage. The artist Michael Batz spent more than a year working on the Blue Port light show. He won acclaim for his light installations across Germany two years ago. Transforming the harbor into art was a special challenge for the Hamburg native. The Hafen is 
It's a harbour for art, and not just for the ships we see here. The harbour is also a harbour of ideas, and the blue light will provide the most magical illumination. Hamburg Harbour is a popular destination for tourists and locals. And now there's another reason to visit. The Queen Mary II was the first of seven cruise ships to dock at the port for the festival. The famous luxury liner often docks at the port and is always greeted by thousands of fans. The Queen of the Seas is 345 meters long, the longest liner in the world. And it's the fitting location to launch the Blueport Light Show with former tennis champion Boris Becker on board. The Queen Mary II only docked at the Hamburg port for 24 hours. Time enough for about 25,000 visitors to view the spectacle in blue in the city's port on Wednesday evening. It's fascinating. Everything's blue. Fantastic. It's perfect, just like they say. Blue, Hamburg, the ocean, amazing, just how I imagined. The artists used around 1,500 fluorescent lights and 60 spotlights to transform the city for the festival. The lights will stay on for five days straight. Switching them off and on again would consume more electricity than simply leaving them on. So the Rhapsody in Blue will continue round the clock until the fireworks mark the final celebration. After two and a half years work, watching this just makes me quiver all over. Seven of the world's largest and loveliest liners will meet up at the Hamburg port during the event in a wash of ocean blue. And now to green as the perfect way to slow down the pace a bit in summertime is to take refuge in the garden. Whether you're a real horticulturalist who plants with precision or someone who just likes to pot and putter around, there's something very relaxing about tending the greenery and flowers on your own private plot. In fact, gardens can even be places of creative reflection and inspiration. And we found three bigwigs from Europe's cultural scene who think so too. A garden is a place of peace and quiet, as well as a food source. You're a gardener if you've got a pot, some earth and a seed. A garden also requires a lot of work. I water plants, I pull weeds, I mow a lot of grass, I cut flowers. And I just wander around the garden contemplating this or that. A garden is an outdoor refuge in many urban areas. I had to get as old as Methuselah with snow white hair before I could enjoy gardens and nature. I was the quintessential city dweller. Three men who all share a passion. The Austrian cabaret artist Roland Düringer started off small with gardening. Over time, he's become an expert. He can hold his own in discussions as diverse as rare vegetables and pond design. The Chinese have a saying about happiness. If you want it for a couple of hours, get drunk. For a year, marry a beautiful wife. For a lifetime, get a garden. It's true. All my garden experiences are good. His motto in the garden, live with nature and not against it. Dringer has learned a lot from his own garden in Lower Austria's St. Pölten, like how to be patient. The garden is actually a living being, which has its own rhythms that you can't influence. It forces you to be patient. Once you've accepted that the garden is as alive as you are, the connections get bigger, things come automatically. In Berlin's Köpenick district, Klaus Peimann has realized his dream of having his own garden. For years, his job as theater director kept him almost permanently on the road. That didn't change until he became the director of the Berliner Ensemble. I really can't afford this place, it's too expensive. But it is like a piece of paradise. There are foxes, wild boar. It was crazy when the boar came around last night. I yelled at them, you're dealing with the former director of the Burgtheater. They charged off into the forest. 
The different smells and the sense of adventure in the garden remind Paimon of the carefree life he experienced as a child in Bremen. I've had a yearning to do this for a long time. I grew up around allotment gardens in Bremen. They were vital to our survival since there was so little food. My father grew potatoes, he raised chickens, ducks, geese. He tried to grow asparagus, but failed. I have great memories of life there in the post-war period. Goethe wanted to hear the grass growing, and Beethoven tried to catch the melody of the blackbirds. Poets, painters and musicians have all taken inspiration from nature. Klaus Paimann also sees a connection between nature and art. We theater people have a responsibility here because theater appears to exclude nature from its artistic space, but at the same time it often takes its inspiration from nature. Museum director Klaus Albrecht Schröder isn't a gardener, but he loves nature. The head of Vienna's Abettina Museum spends weekends with his family in his country house in Lower Austria. For years now, he's had a secret passion. I like to walk for hours in English gardens because they are an escape for me from all the daily toils and worries and problems. It's like being in a different time, but thanks to nature, not timeless, but more like being in another era. Schröder likes to dream about the 19th century. He wishes he'd lived then himself and met the poets and thinkers of that time. As it is, he still has their literature to remember them by. I even sit here in January if it's possible. I have the right things on for even the coldest weather, including below zero temperatures. When it's terribly hot, I sit in the shade, also outside. I always sit outside and read. But Schröder doesn't do any of the gardening. He lets others do that. He considers the garden his respite from everyday life and from himself. And now to silence and reflection of another kind. The late Marcel Marceau was an iconic figure on France's artistic scene who very much defined the art of pantomime in the 20th century. Well, for 26 years now, the southwestern French city of Périgueux, where Marceau actually lived for a short time, has hosted the international mime festival called Mimos. The festival pays tribute to the classic art, all the while seeking to create newer and more modern forms. No doubt the master would have been proud. Some 400 mime artists from all over Europe have come to Périgueux for this year's festival. For one whole week, they transform the town into a giant stage. They perform all over, showing just how diverse mime has become. Dance, performance and acrobatics are all part of the show. students of Marcel Marceau perform Children of Paradise as their tribute to the legendary master. For this show, we've based our style closely on the interpretation of Marcel Marceau. Silence is the most important element. Comme premier fondement. Je pense que Marceau a su toucher. I think Marcel Marceau knew how to touch audiences on every continent. I was moved by his performances too. The tradition we want to uphold is using emotions to communicate with the audience. The six artists from France, Italy, Romania and Bulgaria have a common goal, to keep alive interest in mime. Marcel Marceau rose to fame with his role as the clown Bip. For six decades, the French mime artist delighted audiences the world over. He first became famous internationally in Germany in the 1950s and later in the United States. He died in 2007 at age 84. <laughs> Two of his four children, Camille and Baptiste Marceau, 
have come to the festival this year. An exhibition here pays tribute to the legacy of Marcel Marceau. He not only modernized mime as an art form, he also helped make sure it would continue to thrive. In 1978, he founded a mime school in Paris, which closed two years ago. Right now we're working to make sure he's not forgotten. We hope that France will continue to honor his unique cultural contributions. One group with their own form of expressing mime is the company Akulrap from France, which performed short stories at the festival. We've also included hip-hop in our program. This form of dance incorporates a lot of elements of Marcel Marceau's way of communicating. Dramatic narration gives this dance form its theatricality and suspense. The heirs of Marcel Marceau have found their style while keeping their deep respect for the master. And before you know it, we've reached the end of this edition of our highlights. So thanks for joining us. Until next time, bye-bye. The difficult part about the job is that we all sweat. I don't know if you've seen the lights they use, these HMIs, film lamps that are incredibly hot. And we don't just have one, but three or four. And there's no air conditioning, so it is very hot. But for me personally, the hardest part is keeping my eyes open. If you have sensitive eyes, then these lamps are hard to take. And then, of course, it's hard to do your job and look good. I still hope I do a halfway decent job. <laughs> halfway decent? As always, Yulia cuts a fine figure, man, she even manages to have fun. And she has every reason to be happy. She's one of the most successful models currently working and earns five-figure wages every day that she works. She's never had to apply for jobs either, having been discovered at age 15 at Munich's Oktoberfest by a modeling agent. Since then, her calendar has been well booked and her career really took off once she finished school. There were covers for the most renowned fashion magazines, ad campaigns for major companies, and fashion shows for the hottest labels. Julia Stegna simply has the right face for representing luxury, noble yet natural. Her type is in demand, so the Munich native has relocated to New York for the sake of work. This is in fire. It certainly gets a bit lonely. And as I'm alone a lot, I talk a lot on the phone. I have an enormous phone bill. I talk to my friends and family. I talk to my parents every day, even when I'm in New York, where I live. I have to try to keep the relationships going and try to forget my loneliness a bit. A lunch break at the Munich shoot. Julia doesn't believe in strict diets. It's hard to believe with her trim figure, but she prefers stick to your ribs fare. Somehow it's always the German stuff that you can't really get abroad. I just love the standard German dinner. Good bread, Bavarian sausage, cold cuts, liverwurst, stuff like that. And I like to grab a slice of Liba case and a bread roll whenever I can. I haven't had that yet this time, but before I fly off again, I'll definitely have one, and maybe some Bavarian white sausages too. And what my mom cooks is the best anyway, no matter what it is. But there's little time for visiting mom since Julia has to be back in New York in three days, back to her unglamorous daily life. 
Most people tend to think, oh, models, they don't do housework or other normal things. But when I'm not working, my life is pretty normal. I clean my apartment, do my laundry, I meet up with friends, exercise, all pretty normal. Julia Stegner seems to have kept her feet firmly on the ground, despite the way her glamorous job takes her all over the world. And before you know it, we've reached the end of this edition of our highlights. So thanks for joining us. Until next time, bye-bye.